should be fine. Um, cool. Uh, so, hey, everybody, and welcome to another paper reading group uh, today. And I'm so excited to share that this is the first uh, multimodal paper that we're discussing, and we're also discussing MDTR, which is Modulated Detection for End-to-End -end Multimodal Understanding. Um, so, so the last time at paper reading group, we discussed DETR, um, which is the detection transformer. And today we're doing MDTR, which is a step further, um, which takes DETR to another level, and it starts to uh, mix computer vision and NLP. And we have Eshwarya Kamath joining us. Um, so uh, she's the paper author um, for MDTR. And hey, Eshwarya. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, so Eshwarya, is a, she's a, I'm so impressed uh, and so excited as well to have Eshwarya here today that she's a second year PhD student at New York University Center of Data Science, and she's advised by Professor Yan LeCun and Professor Kyung Hyun Cho. Uh, is that a correct pronunciation? We can correct yeah, me later. It's Kyung Hyun Cho, um, yeah. And has a master's degree in computer science from University of Massachusetts, uh, Amherst. And she's, she's um, working at the intersection of NLP and computer vision. And her interests lie in leveraging information from multiple sources, such as text, images, video, and speech to improve common sense reasoning capabilities of machines. Um, so basically, you've been working on multimodal for quite some time, Ashwara. That's so exciting to hear. And she's previously completed internships at Google Research and Facebook AI Research, as well as worked full time as an ML engineer at Oracle's Machine Learning Research Group. Her work has received a best paper reward at the representation learning for NLP workshop at ACL 2019. Um, that's really a lot, Eshwarya. That's so, um, please tell us about your journey. I'm so, before we get started with the paper, maybe um, tell us how uh, that journey started and you know how you got into multimodal. Yep, sure. Um, so I guess uh, journey starting was in India. I did my undergrad at uh, Manipal Institute of Technology um, in electronics. So not much uh, programming. It was yeah more on the hardware side. Um, towards the end of the undergrad, I started like doing these uh, online Coursera courses and things like that. It was like, oh, machine learning is cool. TensorFlow was out there by then. So yeah, I applied to like computer science masters and um, that's where I got my like first uh, like experience with research. So Andrew McCallum was my research mentor at UMass and he basically just like changed what I wanted to do in life because at that point I was like, yeah, I'm going to do a master's and I get a job and that'll be fine. But, and you know, that's going to be my life. But basically he was like, Oh no, no, do research. This is really fun. And he like, you know, mentored me and like uh, also helped me go uh, to like new Rips, which was like my first uh, conference in like 2017 and introduced me to a lot of cool people and showed me like the starry life of research. Research. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is really awesome. There's so many cool and smart people who also like know how to have a good time and stuff like that. So yeah, it was, um, that was like the beginning. And uh, I got my first uh, paper at UMass, uh, which was a short paper, but that was like mostly NLP and um, at NACL in 2018. And then once I started working at Oracle, I explored more like on the industry side, how to apply things. And uh, I realized I wanted a bit more freedom in like, in terms of what I like to work on. So I applied um, for a PhD after like working on a bunch of research projects with some friends, you know, to like improve my PhD application. So yeah, and what you happened after that, because uh, I had an interview with Jan and we discussed a bunch of stuff about like common sense reasoning and multimodality. And he was like super excited about like, you know, going beyond just image or just text and using self-supervised learning and also putting it together with like multimodality and yeah, going along this uh, path. So I started working on this after I joined NYU. So yeah, it's my- Oh, wow, that's, that's really exciting. Um, I've always meant to ask, we never got an option to, but how's Jan like in real life? <laughs> he's super chill. <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's, he's like uh, really, really nice and understanding. And like, you know, I, I never feel like in the beginning I was like, oh my God, during award winner, how am I ever going to talk to him, right? Like the fear, especially like that interview when, which I had with him where he told me like during the interview, oh, you know, I'm going to be taking a PhD student. Do you want to be a PhD student with me? And I was like, what? <laughs> Did you just say that? Because <laughs> I was totally not expecting it. And it was just like out of the blue. And yeah, so I was super excited. And since then, I think like we have a pretty good relationship. He is very open to like me trying out ideas or like, you know, 
pursuing my own uh, direction. So he like has some high level uh, interest like you know, these energy based models and regularized energy based models for like different kinds of uh, tasks. So he doesn't really care about what task you work on. So, you know, at that point, he wasn't like that much into NLP and I was so he was like, yeah, we can like find common interests. And he did try to like find a project which, you know, overlapped with his interests and mine, which was super nice. And then during my internship last year at, uh, at FAIR with him, uh, I started exploring more of the multimodal uh, area. So, yeah. Wow, that, that is really exciting to hear. Um, thanks for that introduction, Ashwara. I really appreciate it. Um, so for everybody, uh, if you have questions for Ashwara like I have, uh, this is the link 1db.me slash mdetr. So let me just show you where that will take you. So if I go to that link, uh, that's the wrong place. One second. So 1db.me slash mdetr. So that should take you to the Fast AI forums. That's where we've been hosting all our discussions. So you'll see this link, uh, mdetr. And then if you go uh, there, you can just click reply. And I, I'm just going to do this test and click reply. I think this will make an error. Yeah, at least 20 characters. I'm going to make this 20 characters. All right, so this is, um because we're also live on YouTube and we also have Zoom chat, so it's really hard for me to monitor questions everywhere. Um, so sure what we do is basically, as we're going through the papers, um, we're just going to have a look at uh, this forum and then that's where all the questions will be. So this is for the Ask Me Anything section right at the end. Okay, sounds good. All right, with that being said, um, let's start and, and let's start to dig in uh, this paper, uh, which is MDETR. So I guess we'll start with um, an introduction. And then the first thing when I was reading this paper, figure one was like, that's the first thing I ever saw. And I'm like a pink elephant and the model can recognize a pink elephant. Um, so please tell us like, uh, I guess it would be really helpful if you could tell us what is multimodal understanding and um, how is the how is MDTR different from like DETR, which is just object detection, and how did the work come about? Sure. So um, DETR was like the first object detection model, which went like end to end, so you can train it like uh, fully end to end. And I mean, it's solving a different task. So detection is a classical vision, you know, task. It to localize and recognize objects in the image. Whereas multimodal uh, reasoning or like multimodal understanding is a much more broad term, I would say, because it like has a lot of more components to it. You have to understand, like if you right here, we're learning about text and image multimodal, but of course you can also, you know, do other modalities like speech. And then if you have videos, you can learn from that as well. But yeah, so the main idea of our paper was like to extend from um, what previous work were, was based on. So most of the previous work for multimodal um, approaches all did object detection as some sort of pre-processing step. So it's always like a pipeline approach where you first do detection, you find a bunch of objects of interest, and then you have this uh, multimodal reasoning or like understanding phase where you actually align image and text. So this is problematic because the object detectors all have like a fixed uh, label set, right? So they're trained on like Coco or VG or whatever, which have a fixed number of object classes. So if you want to reason about objects and attributes, which suppose this pink elephant, right? Coco does not have a pink elephant. So in like your VQA task, suppose you have some question which is about a pink elephant and the image has it, there's really no way you can reason about it. On the other hand, if you like make the object detection part more central to your approach, which is what we try to do, then you can basically detect anything that's found in free form text. So as long as you know you have some aligned text and uh, object, uh, like you have the alignment between some text and the object in the image, you can recognize it and you can like uh, reason over it in the VQA or whatever other task that you're interested in. I mean, there's a whole bunch of multimodal tasks. There's image captioning, there's VQA, you know, there's face grounding and segmentation so yeah it's a uh, like phrase based segmentation so yeah it's um mditor was trying to get away from this limitation basically where you have to have this object detector trained on a bunch of classes and you can only do stuff with those classes that's that was the yeah motivating idea 
Yeah, the, and, and like in terms of that idea, it's very, I guess, a similar approach to what DTR tried to do with object detection as a as a whole, like because there were two steps. You had a region of interest, and then that's when the detection would happen. And then yeah. we see MDTR, which is kind of like taking away that bottleneck. So it's it's really good to see like things being yeah. built uh, one I mean, after the other. It was like collaboration with uh, Nico and Gab as well, who are yeah. like Nico's, N Nicola is the one who uh, wrote the reader paper and he was like basically my mentor during my internship along with Jan because he was like working on this for a whole while now. And it, yeah, he has a lot of, um, you know, experience. And initially, actually, when I started working on uh, MDTR, it wasn't called that because I wasn't trying to do it as modulated detection. It was more of a multitask model. So I think there's been like a bunch of papers actually, which ended up doing that in the last few months. But that's the first thing I had tried basically to do image captioning, like have a decoder for captioning and the deter decoder, which does detection so that there's some like sort of synergy between the two and you have better performance. It did okay. Like I would say the results were decent, but it wasn't like clear how to make this help downstream tasks such as VQA. And I guess the main, like my main motivation was like, learn uh, to make a model where you can apply it to like a whole bunch of tasks and like which is uh, in a way that's useful to downstream tasks so that's why we kind of pivoted at some point after the internship I started looking at referring expressions and then I was like oh, wait what if like you know you find stuff which is actually referred to and that's basically what made the direction shift from just using detector uh, detector as a detector and doing detection and captioning to like actually doing modulated detection. Yeah, wow, that, that's really exciting uh, to hear. And I guess this is another thing, just so you mentioned, I just want to highlight that in the paper as well, like exactly what you said, there's like several downstream tasks, um, like phrase counting, uh, referring expansion, comprehension, segmentation, and then you've achieved this, this paper has achieved state of the art on a lot of popular benchmarks, which is um, very exciting. And I'm really uh, keen to see like what's coming next after MDTI and like where this will lead to. So I guess we'll leave all of that for the AMA towards the end on what your plans are after um, MDTR. So I guess um, from the app, so what we do is we just go through the paper section by section. Okay. Um, so in terms of abstract, uh, I guess this was just about providing the main idea about the paper. And uh, one thing uh, maybe that I do want to highlight is the pre-training of the network on 1.3 text uh, image pairs, yeah. which, and that was a data set that was curated at Facebook. Is that correct? Well, uh, we just okay. used existing public data set. So for our images, we use Coco and VG and Flickr. So there's some overlap between Coco and VG. Uh, and then there's like a few extra images, which are only in VG. And then there's like, uh, I don't know, not that many images in Flickr. So like 2200, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't remember the exact number, but yeah. So these data sets all existed and we just went and looked for data sets where you have an explicit alignment between um, words in the text and the object. So you, we need this kind of alignment because we use it in our loss functions. Um, of course, like it's a strong requirement and like future work or like subsequent work is going to try and like reduce this uh, strong requirement. But yeah, we didn't make any new data sets. It was just about uh, uh, taking it from VG regions. It's actually a very rich source of information because they have, it's uh, extremely noisy. So you, we did do like quite a lot of like filtering or like, you know, noise reduction in the, in the region to uh, box kind of annotations. But yeah, th there's a lot of like really good data out there, uh, which is like extremely long tailed and very interesting. For example, one of the images, like I remember there was a, a tiny glass which had a, you know, an inscription of a tree on it. And they even like annotate that. Like it's crazy how detailed the annotations are. So it's a, a very rich source of information and VG is just like amazing. So we use basically just existing stuff, not, nothing like made at Facebook basically. Yeah. Right, interesting. Thank you for that uh, background. So I guess then we'll move on towards the introduction. Is there anything else you want to add in abstract or be good for, for introduction? Um, um, I guess about the 1.3 million image text pairs, the, the main difference uh, from prior work like Oscar and you know all of these uh, recent papers, they all are trained on conceptual captions, which, is, which has a lot more images. It's like 3.3 million images, whereas we use only 200,000 images, which is like an order of magnitude smaller. 
but we of course have like a stronger supervision in terms of like you know the actual part of the text that is annotated whereas they use a lot more data but it's sort of weaker because it's just image and text it's not like object level so yeah just just to make that point because some of the reviewers were a bit um, confused about like if it's 1.3 million or 200,000 because we say that interchangeably and yeah 200,000 is images just to be clear Right, and then the 1.3 million is the image and text space because you exactly. can, for one because image you can have multiple text. Yeah, exactly. Correct. That makes uh, sense. All right, so I guess um, uh, when I was first looking at the paper, uh, what I what I try and do is I just go through the architecture and I just try and understand the paper from an architecture perspective. Um, mm -hmm. So we know uh, that MDTI is then from an introduction perspective. We know that MDTI is trying to mix the text or basically the text modality with the image modality. So it's mixing text and vision. And then um, I guess maybe it will be helpful if we could go through figure two from, from here on, uh, Ashwarya. So um, did you wanna um, share on what's going on in figure two and yeah, again, explain again. how that works? So um, on the left, we're gonna look at the image going from left to right. So the, on the left, we have this picture of a cat jumping over a fence and you know you have the caption, which is aligned with it, which says a cat with white paws jumps over a fence in front of a yellow tree. Now uh, in our annotations, we have explicit mapping that you know certain boxes in the image are mapped to certain spans of text. So that's what we show in the absolute right uh, image and you know the color coded text. It's just to show you that the box corresponding to, to cat, for example, the orange one, um, we know from the ground truth that it is uh, you know uh, mapped to like a cat, the span of the of the text. So yeah, so the image is passed through a CNN, just like in Dieter, you'd get a bunch of image features, which is like you know just uh, linearized. So it's flattened the. Uh, Empty box is meant to show that it's a flattening. Uh, similarly, from the text, you get Roberta embeddings, uh, apply a linear to make it the same size, and then you have like the sequence of text features. On the image side, there's no uh, positional embedding that's uh, already there, like Roberta has sequence embeddings already, so we, we don't add an extra one. But on the image side, we use 2D positional embeddings so that it knows which part of the image these features are from. And then uh, we concatenate these on the sequence dimension. So you basically get this really long sequence of like image features and then text features, right? Um, yeah, so what the part after that is basically just a Dieter transformer. So you have a, a encoder in Dieter. Here we call it a cross encoder because it takes in both image and text features, but otherwise there's like nothing different about it. And then the decoder basically predicts uh, boxes just as in Dieter. The main difference is that the predicted boxes are not mapped to explicit class labels. So there's no more notion of like, you know, 81 or whatever class labels in Coco. Here it's just like, we since we know in the ground truth that that orange box is mapped to a cat, we will supervise it to predict the actual, like a soft distribution over the span where it's uniform over all the parts that correspond to that box. So yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense. Let's try and um, I guess um, when I was first looking at this, that's the first difference that I saw is like, in, and you've mentioned that in the paper as well, is like how DDR maps the boxes to the class IDs. Um, and then instead we're over here, because we're doing multimodal, what you want to do is you want to have the red box correspond to the tokens a cat, whereas you want to have the purple one, which is like the four bounding boxes for the paws, which corresponds yeah. to the white paws. So I guess that was really helpful um, yeah. to see. And um, one thing that has always helped me is if it's okay, if we maybe start going through dimensions or just maybe uh, tensor shapes, and then maybe that will help uh, clear that understanding, or maybe we can move on and not go through the tensor shapes. Uh, sure. So I guess like the box, you will have so like, yeah, go ahead. Do you mind if I just go through, maybe we have our, um, You can do it. I yeah. was just gonna, I was just gonna do it very quickly, just uh, for anybody who's, who's new to like uh, DETA or MDTR. So I just wanted to uh, do it very quickly is um, so if we have uh, an input of say one by three by five and two, well, it would be um, something like that, which is one image and three channels and five and two by five and two. And then we have this whole uh, text over here, which let's say is is 10 words. So what Roberta is, and please correct me at any point if you feel like yeah. my uh, understanding is different, um, but then what Roberta would do is for each of these 10, it would convert it into a, a say a 10 by 196, I'm not sure what the embedding dimension is. 768? Okay. 
So it would do 768. So that's going to convert those 10 words into an embedding of 10 by 768. And then from a CNN, what we would get is something like one by say 64 channels and maybe like a 16 by 16 spatial dimension. So far, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And then we just flatten this out. So we, you could have a reshaping and flattening things out. And then this is where this dimension would go in and they both get concatenated. So we have- yeah. So before you, the end. Bef when you flatten it, you're going to have like some feature dimension. That's why there's a linear so that you convert it to the dimension of the transformer basically, which was 256 for us. So before yeah. we add the positional embedding and concat, the text and image features are both like basically just, uh, you know, 256 dimensional. And then we concat it on the sequence dimension. So it becomes length of the image features uh, plus the length of the text features. And the last dimension is always 256 basically. All oh, right. Okay. That makes uh, good. That, that, that does really help. And then finally the transformer over here, because now we have the concatenate list. So the transformer over here, that's very similar to the DETR. Yeah. And we just pass that through the transformer. So now the transformer learns to uh, find that, um, basically find that relationship between text and images. So that's how this model then starts to learn that, okay, a cat are these, because now the DETR or the transformer itself is going to start predicting the bounding boxes. So this is where the model starts to learn, okay, a cat is related to this red bounding box coordinates. Is that a, is that a good summary of the understanding so far? Yeah. So yeah, so the, the there is like a matching step which happens during prediction, yeah. right? Just as in DETER. And basically during ground truth, we're going to like know which uh, box to map to which uh, like instead of the label here, you have a soft token distribution that you're predicting and it's the, like everything else remains the same basically. Yeah. Absolutely. And the matching, that's the bipartite matching yeah. criterion that, that's part of the ETR. It's the Perfect. same. We have the same, like, yeah, this was something uh, which the reviewers uh, asked us to add. So I'll add if it's like confusing to anyone. Um, the deter matching step exists here too. We also have the deter losses for the you know box prediction. In addition, we have like the uh, contrastive and soft token prediction. So yeah. Right. Okay. Um. Thanks very much. So I guess then that understanding sort of I believe covers uh, uh somewhat of the method and and the we've already looked at the architecture so that covers the overall architecture and it covers like how the shapes would propagate through this transformer. Is there anything you want to add so far? Because I was thinking we'd get started with the losses. Yeah, next. sure. No worries. I'm like answering questions also in the chat. Oh, okay. Thanks very much for doing that. Nice. I'm very bad at doing multitasking. So I guess because <laughs> yeah, you come from doing, a multimodal model, but you're good talking. at multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> While you're talking, I can answer the questions. So it's no worries. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to see. Okay. Um, so then as uh, Ashwara just mentioned that uh, in uh, in training, we, we also have two additional loss functions. So uh, for anybody that's new to DETR, I would again uh, mention that uh, this is something that if you want to have a look at the DETR, when we keep referring to DETR, we're just saying the DETR um, paper, which is the end-to-end -end detection with transformers. And um, last week at Weights and Mices, we also had a paper reading group for this. And I also have written a blog post about this. Uh, which is the annotated transformer. Um, so we still have all of those loss functions, as you're saying, Ashwarya, which is set yep. criterion, which is still the matching and uh, yep. everything's happening as is. But mm -hmm. what you've done is because this is different from predicting class ID. So instead of like for every bounding box uh, where in DEDR we would predict for this CAD, we would just say predict a class ID of yep. um, that for maybe example. 81. Right. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just putting in numbers. Right, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we would have the class ID say 81 for the cat, or we would have a class ID of say 29, which is just how the ETR would do it and it would try and match these bounding boxes to those IDs. Here, what we want to do is 29 needs to be matched to these three tokens. Yep. Is that correct? Okay. And then 81 needs to be matched to these two tokens. Yep. So I'm and, and saying I like tokens. To mention that it's also like like it's a many to many mapping right because you can have many like in white pause for example there are four boxes that are mapped to the same text and it can also be possible that you have two boxes which are referred to by the same like co-referent text for example like in Flickr, for example they have like some sentences like a couple so a couple can be uh, shown with like 
the full box and then you know they again refer to the individual people so they also have like a reference to the person you know it could be like the two different boxes but the same like text or you should know that they're talking about the same people in like two references of the text because of the box yeah so i was just saying that it can have many boxes for one text and many texts for one box like both ways yeah i guess that's a that's a really really good point thanks for sharing that so i guess even in this image it, if this wasn't a cat if this was say something like many cats with white yeah, paws yeah. are jumping over a fence so then this very image could have multiple cats in there so exactly for two like for for the word cats for one word you still have yeah. many objects so, in the image so the important po- po- part here would be like if there is a sentence which has two women right like we there's an example later in the paper where we show like a woman wearing a watch whereas there's another woman where who has like white hair so if there was no qualifier the uh, box for women should have like mapped to all like there's no like there's nothing which is distinguishing them right so it should be all women basically but if you say women who has white hair you know that there's something qualifying it so it like distinguishes the two so yeah that's that's important in like how we also construct the data later and it will come up uh, for the pre training data so just mentioning it now yeah uh, thanks very much ashwara that's really really helpful um so i guess then with that understanding i guess we are okay to start having a look at the losses so again just to repeat what we want to do is we want to have the bounding boxes be assigned to some tokens of the text so um the two loss functions that we have as ashwarya mentioned that have been added to uh, dta and mdtr adds them is the soft token prediction and the contrastive alignment um so ashwarya maybe did you want to um share yeah. some things about or just provide an introduction to soft yeah. token prediction uh, to start do, with do you want me to like share my screen and like show a slide because it might be easier to explain with that yeah yes. please um you can you should be able to share your screen now Okay, one second. Let me find the window. Yep. Sorry, one second. That's okay. Meanwhile, I'll just have a look at any questions that we might have. Can you see my screen? It's coming up now, so I'm just gonna yeah. Now we can. Okay. So yeah. So the first one is the soft token prediction loss. Uh, this image helps because it's like the same one as we've been looking at. So to uh, tell you concretely what the ground truth looks like, like how we construct it, we have a map which basically says it's zero for all the. uh places you know all the token positions where this object doesn't have anything to do with it and wherever this uh, object is referred to you need to have like a uniform distribution over it so it's going to be like 0.5 0.5 here so in in terms of, uh, in case of like this uh, the paws all of these four boxes will have the same distribution over the white paws and in the, in case of no object basically you're saying it doesn't correspond to any of this it's going to have like you know all of its uh, mass on this uh, no object token in detail also this uh, no object token existed for when you don't have uh, a matching object for a particular uh, you know prediction but here we instead of having a label um, it's just implemented as like the last token basically so if you have like a max length of 255 it's like 256 if that makes sense and um, so yeah the, what i was saying earlier is like suppose this cat is referred to again and if the sentence was a cat with white paws jumps over a fence um, and the cat is like really cute or something like that if that cat is referred to again it would have like you know 0.25 0.25 and the 0.25 0.25 again for the remaining for the other place that the cat is referred so i'm just trying to point out that the span that you're aligning to doesn't have to be contiguous it's anywhere in the sentence wherever that you know object is referred to you're going to have a uniform distribution over all of the token positions so i hope that's clear um if you have any questions you can ask and then this is the soft token prediction and then the other one is the um contrastive alignment so here the idea is we need to figure out which objects uh and which parts of the text should have representations that are closer together so in the first case in in the soft token alignment sorry 
in the soft token prediction you're only getting like positional information but there's nothing that's really being done about the actual embeddings of the objects and the actual embeddings of the text right because the the prediction is just like okay i'm going to give you a span over the positions of the text but what about like the actual representations of the uh, image and text of the objects and text so that we fix by using this uh, contrastive alignment so if you're not familiar with it it's a uh, a very standard thing now in like subsupervised learning it's this uh, it's called an info nce loss nce stands for noise contrastive estimation the uh, equation we can look at again in the paper but at a very high level what you want is things that are referred to uh, in text and in the image should like which correspond to each other for example this red uh, box around this blue ball and the text is ball or yellow so the first token t1 basically uh, which corresponds to this word ball should have um a like a one for the box which is red as well as this other ball right because you have like the word ball you know that these are both balls so if you have four objects both of these have to be positive whereas the rest have to be like negative so essentially what you're doing here is taking the embedding for the object uh, ball which both of these are and trying to make them as close as possible to the embedding for the word ball so yeah that's that's the idea and this is a symmetric loss so this is what i showed you from token to objects but the same way you can go from objects uh, to tokens so for the box um, for the red box it basically is this uh, ball right the first word and yeah so like you can basically look at all of the other x's i have and figure out uh, how to make them and this is used in uh, the contrastive alignment clause after making this um, uh, matrix we can go back to the equations maybe i can talk to her no i think that was really really helpful i've i've um yeah. that's one Looking of the best the equation is uh, a bit like daunting but if you if you just like break it down it's like what do you want to do is just like make the embeddings of things that should be similar close together yeah. and whatever should not be like a ball in a cylinder should not be you know the embeddings for that should not be similar so you like push them apart so yeah absolutely so maybe let's just go into some details now that we have a really good understanding of um those concepts um so maybe i will try and summarize and then maybe i'm sure you could correct me if i'm if i'm wrong somewhere um so again for soft token prediction as you said uh what we want to do is we want to try and match a cat to these two tokens so if we have say um in soft token prediction let's say if we have uh let's say we have the cat object and then i've i've got so this this i'm referring to as the object and let's say i've got words 1 2 3 4 so the words 1 and 2 are the one that need to be assigned to this to this object so what we're trying to do is for this object then this this loss cuz these are ones um which is every word or every token that's corresponding to the object that's valid at one which is the mask as you mentioned or the ground so the, truth so the soft token prediction it's uh, normalized by the length of the span so basically this will be 0.5 oh, sorry 0.5. that's yeah. a good point sorry yes so that will be 0.5 0.5 and then everything's going to be zero so as many tokens as we have you will divide it uh uniformly over those tokens so if this was something like if i'm referring to the object say uh if i'm referring to the object say tree then and i've got um three tokens that refer to the word three in my sentence this time then this would be 0.33 and 0.33 and then zero and then what we're trying to do is then this matrix would become a kind of the ground truth for this and then could we just use bce or binary cross entropy it's a, on it's top? a soft cross entropy basically soft yeah. cross entropy yeah. exactly so then we could use something like a soft cross entropy to then make the model match so in this loss i guess the model is still learning some information about because it knows where the tree is it has some information about the bonding bounding box it yeah. is learning to associate somewhat where the tree is in the image to then those three tokens like one two three tokens that we have yeah. with, with that are corresponding to the tree is that um, yeah. is that exactly. correct so far this is this okay. is mostly like a non parametric alignment because you know the actual embeddings of the objects and text there's nothing like forcing them to be similar through this loss you, it's just learning about positional information which is why yeah, we need another loss which is the contrastive yeah okay um so then just as you said so contrastive alignment then 
is slightly different and it's a bit more powerful in the sense that now this is what is going to match the tree to the object. So because um, if I, I think if I go back to the image, because we're going to pass the, we're going to, let's just take the example of the cat. Mm -hmm. um, so because we're going to pass this cat through the CNN and we're going to get some embedding, let's just say we're going to get an embedding of 768 for this cat. That just represents yeah. that, that representation of that cat. And similarly, we're going to get some embedding. So when we concatenate, or let's just say it's just some embedding, uh, yeah. which is again of say dimension 768, we can yeah. reshape or uh, I'm not exactly sure what the dimensions are that we can yeah. uh, not go into the details, but just for, an, for a high level, both of these now are seven are represented by vectors. So cat is represented by 768 long vector. And similarly, those, those two words are again, this vector. And yeah. then what this loss is trying for to do contrast, is it's trying to make the, sure. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. The, for the contrastive, I just wanted to say that we take the output of this uh, and the cross encoder. So there's this concat and transformer, right? The transformer has an encoder and a decoder. The output of that uh, cross encoder, the representation of the text there. So there's already been some like cross attention uh, or like self attention to the, you know, uh, image features inside that cross encoder and we're getting the output like somewhere in the middle of this transformer uh, for the text features and for the image features it's the output of the uh, boxes yeah that would help i guess <laughs> uh yeah i was just gonna quickly bring up that uh image that you're referring to so let me just quickly do that when it loads <laughs> yeah lots of pictures i'm in australia so the wi-fi is really bad they yeah, say yeah. um the quantas yeah, and they say the Qantas Airlines has a better uh, Wi-Fi than all of Australia. So um, <laughs> that's, just, that's just an Australian joke. Then. No. Yeah. Thanks for having us um, earlier this week, by the way, uh, to accommodate me. No, no problems at all. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so I was just going to go. Yeah, to, that, I that, guess, window, yeah. Uh, so, that will do. Or maybe um, what about the there was this really nice image about the transformer how about this one yeah sure i mean the other one is like more compact because we don't really care okay, about let's go about it. that yeah um there we go so this is yeah so this is DTR. The, the uh in detail you have the image features which go into this encoder so the the bottom part of the transformer encoder is basically just this flattened representation of the image so it, in addition to that flattened representation of the image, we also have the Roberta features as like, just like imagine a little longer vector instead of whatever you have here, right? But at the output, the encoder is basically going to have like a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So you're going to also get hidden features of the same length. So the text features that we use for the contrastive alignment are basically what you get as the output of the encoder. And for the um, image features, which are the object, we get the output of the decoder. So what we see as the output here is exactly what we use and try to like basically make those embeddings close together. They, they do go through like a, a linear mapping to make them a smaller dimension because it's been shown that, you know, when you're doing this contrastive learning or like contrastive loss, you don't need to do the dot product in like 768 or whatever, even 256 dimensional space. So we project down to 64 dimensions and then do the dot product for, for the contrast with them. No, perf uh, perfect. Thanks very much, Ishvara. So um, I guess then that's why you have the two losses here, which is one for, because um, we, we could have multiple objects for a single token, or we could have multiple tokens for a single object. That's why you have yeah. these two losses which is token and object, and you just add them up uh, or take the average uh, of these uh, two losses. Uh, the image which I had shown earlier with the clever example. So we have this matrix, which is like objects on one side and tokens on the other. So basically you're normalizing row wise for one of them and normalizing column wise for the other. And those are the two like L, O, yeah. and L, D. Yeah. Perfect. Um, thanks very much. I guess then that's the, that's the losses. And we're next to uh, pre-training, I believe. Yeah. Um, so we will try and um, so getting into pre-training then, uh, did you want to give us an, you've already told us that there's 1.5 million text pairs and about 200,000 images. Mm -hmm. Um, so how did the, so what exactly is the pre-training? How is that different from what we're doing? And then how do we use that model for further downstream tasks? Sure. So, um, generally when, uh, we have multimodal models, which, you know, have object detection as a pre-processing thing, they usually get the object and then the pre-training, um, uh, 
tasks are generally things like masking out part of the text and like predicting the image or masking out like you know some regions and trying to predict them and stuff like that or like image text matching is a very popular one as well um so we kind of uh, go away from all of these we don't like maybe it'll be even better if we try that we actually didn't try language modeling or you know master whatever uh, on any of our uh, encoders or decoders but uh, what we want to like kind of establish is that if you want to like reason about something uh, in a downstream task you have to like make the central task of pre training actually figuring out which text is referring to which part of the image so this task of like phrase grounding is what we make central to our approach and our, our pre training only does this one task which is you know uh, phrase grounding so what is phrase grounding for example like you have this uh can you make the image a bit bigger the the uh, caption yeah, sure yeah so for example if you have this let's just look at the first part of the sentence the person in the gray shirt with a watch on their wrist uh you can see that this person in the uh, image which is in the purple box um would be the person being referred to here right so if the annotations came from vg or yeah like flicker there's a different like level of density in annotations across the different data sets that we use so in the referring expression annotations which we use for coco images it basically just gives you one box for the entire text so like the person in gray shirt with a watch on their wrist whereas in flicker they would actually also annotate the gray shirt and the watch maybe even the wrist <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah basically all the named entities would be like uh, would be annotated so in our case when we want to try and combine because we don't have that much data of this kind so we had to like make do with like these different levels of annotation so we just use flicker the way it is coco referring expressions and on vg we use vg regions as well as gqa uh, balanced data set so it's like a subset of the huge 22 million questions so the gqa questions are basically just used as as is in they're, they're not used for question answering so at that at this stage it will be like what is the color of the banana you know in the bottom right part of the image or whatever so basically gqa gives you alignment between the objects referred to in the question and you know boxes in the image so we decided to use that as well um to uh, an important point that i want to make about like uh, the data um, combination is that if we had these separate sentences oh uh so to combine flicker ref coco and like all of these data sets what we did was if the sentence only has one box for the entire text where we can see that there are more you know uh, objects that could be referred to in the in the sentence then we extract the root of the sentence this is not optimal obviously because like this is just because we had to like combine multiple data sets but um uh what we do is like use like a spacey parser and just say what is the root of the sentence it's the person in the gray shirt so basically we just use that as the annotation which is why you have this the person as the only thing that's mapped to this entire sentence so now uh, another po- important point is for 200000 images we have many text does it make sense to just have one image in one text like and just like you know repeat the same image and have the different text each time instead of doing that we realize that our soft token prediction loss if we are just using the root would be utterly useless for example here like the person in the gray shirt with a watch on their wrist the like the root would be the person and it's like kind of trivial to always just predict the root right so then you're not doing anything about the positional information like it's not helping you on the other hand if we like combine multiple sentences where the rest of the sentence has the other person wearing a blue sweater the third person in a gray coat and scarf now to like make to figure out if the box corresponds to which part of the sentence or like the root of which part of the sentence it really needs to like reason about uh giving the token positions to like the person from the first sentence or the other person from the second sentence etc so this density increase of like information is extremely important to make the soft token prediction useful and also like for the uh, contrastive alignment because the annotation would be the same right so yeah that that was like the thought behind uh, the different stages that we went through for a data collection and combination like in initially we were like yeah let's just like combine the data but then you know it really makes a difference if some of the data has only 
like the whole sentence for uh, uh, for one box. So we also went through a phase where we were trying to have a unlikelihood loss kind of thing where we were like avoiding penalizing for finding boxes that in sentences where there are other entities, but we don't have annotations for. So it got really messy and we were like, okay, let's not go down this like uh, messy road and we'll just like extract the root. So, yeah. <laughs> No, that makes sense. I guess uh, for someone like me, I'll be very honest, like, because I'm not like I've been part of the computer vision side of things, but not so much on the multimodal side of things. And then until I hit MDTR or started reading about it, that's when it struck me like the amount of detail that goes into uh, getting a model to train. So uh, tell me, like, when you were first experimenting with MDTR, were there lots of failed experiments? And oh, yeah, because I don't think the model would have just started to train and like match the uh, and that's when you would go back and forth. It's like, do we change the pre training and then you come back and you train your and model was, and things like that? It was even crazier because um, so I did my internship in summer where I was doing a bunch of experiments, but this pivot towards modulated detection happened much later. And, you know, I didn't have compute to do these large scale experiments anymore. So most of our like loss uh, uh, designing and all of this stuff happened on Clever because that's the only thing we could run on like NYU compute. <laughs> so at some point we started collaborating with, uh, you know, Gab and uh, Gabriel and Ishan and Manat. And, you know, they also started pitching in, in like running experiments and like helping us uh, with uh, infrastructure set side of things. And that made it easier to like run more large scale experiments. But uh, I'll tell you that for pre-training, it was like one shot. Like we didn't, mm. we didn't have multiple chances because like we, like we were in a, we had like pretty good preliminary results and on Flickr, even without pre-training, uh, like we'll see in the table that, you know, we had like a eight or nine point increase on the best uh, state of the art on Flickr entities without pre-training. So we were like convinced that this would work with pre-training as well. So we basically just had one shot before the uh, SCV deadline and we just ran it for one week, <laughs> the pre-training and then like ran the downstream. So yeah, we didn't have much space because of the time constraints as well for the deadlines, but uh, yeah, a lot of uh, experimentation happened on Clever. So that's, that's what I'll say. I think that's, that's also a good point that you make. Like, again, this is something we could take from 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 the paper as well, like the experimentation, even though it was done on a smaller subset, it, it kind of generalizes to a to a yeah. bigger. But then also there's this. I don't know if that balance. always happens. Yeah, I don't know if that always happens. I remember like some of the people from our team were like very uh very of like spending too much time on clever because they were like, yeah, you know, I've done this before. I spent a whole summer doing clever stuff, assuming it'll generalize to real data, and then <laughs> nothing worked. <laughs> so we were like uh, biting our nails when we ran the pre training, but thankfully it worked out. And how many days of that nail biting was it? When the I think it was like, was I don't know, nine days. because there was <laughs> That would have been tough. Oh, tough yeah. nine days, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. That's really, I guess this is really good to see. Like when you read the paper, these are the stories you miss. Like, oh, this yeah. is like how much effort or there's like, because in the real world, when we, when the paper hits us, so when I'm, when we're reading the paper, we don't really see, oh, the paper was written within a deadline and they were like these compute resources or this person was actually living a life and real human being who's writing this paper. So there's like all of these constraints that come into it. And it's really good to see those stories yeah. um, and hear those stories. And of course, like as PhD students, you want like, you know, papers, you want to like get to the deadline because like, yeah, it, you know, it, it feels good when you like submit a paper. So every, of, of course, like it would not have been possible, like without uh, Nicola's help, basically we like stayed up and like worked on it like crazy for like the, you know, month or and a half before the deadline. And it would have been impossible without his help. He's also a really good software engineer. So that like, I don't have that much software engineering experience. So like I can, you know, write a reasonably fast code, but like to make it actually work uh, and performant, I, like he helped a lot with all of this stuff. Yeah. And I think that experience from data, data in the yeah. past would come in really handy exactly. as well when, when we're doing this. That's, that's really exciting to hear. Um, so I guess uh, in terms of the pre-training, this the Roberta model was just straight from Hugging Face. Yeah. It's a uh, thanks to Hugging Face. So <laughs> shout out to them for like making everything so easy to use amazing that's great and uh i guess the then the last thing that i in this section i was really excited to see was the team library so mm -hmm. someone who's been involved in team for quite some time and uh to see ross uh and then that library so 
the backbones as well then are customizable. So you could use any backbone that offers exactly. feature extraction from Tim. Is that correct? Exactly, yeah. And this is very different from all of the other multimodal approaches because they've been using like, you know, the same uh, bottom up, top down extractor from like whichever 2017, which was trained once on VG. And basically, like, there's a Docker which everybody uses to extract images. And nobody ever thought of like improving the detector. I mean, Vinville did, of course. They, you know, uh, applied. Um, they used a lot more detection data sets. I don't, I don't think they like improved their detector as such. They just like use more data, but I'm just saying that like nobody else has like, I guess made the effort or like tried to plug in, you know, better and uh, yeah, just better backbones. And there's no reason not to, right? And Dieter made that like extremely easy for us because they had like a, a very smooth pipeline for just like plugging in anything, uh, any pipeline and any uh, backbone. And we're like, yeah, why not efficient at B3, B5? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's keep trying and then yeah. let's keep the one that, and then I see you use the noisy with uh, noisy students. I think that would help as well for the backbone because we want to extract uh, really good features from the image exactly, itself. Yeah. And then uh, when, when there's like- Use this stuff, right? Like it, it, it's like somebody just mentioned that using bottom up top down detect is such a pain. Yeah, because like you have to like, extract the features, dump them, and then like do all of this stuff. Here, just part of your model, you train everything end to end and it's just like clean. So, yeah. No, that, that's the benefit of it. And that's what we see, like if robot is trained on like so many million tokens, then there's no reason not to have the vision backbones be trained on that many yeah, exactly. tokens. Yeah, exactly. Why only do the decks? Yeah, exactly. That's wonderful to hear. So I guess now we're just down to the last sections. I'm also conscious of time. So maybe we'll go through the, maybe Ashwari, you could uh, just quickly go through the downstream tasks. And sure. if you have some stories you want to say, share with us about um, any of the downstream fine tuning. Yeah, so so um, for phrase grounding, basically because our data and our pre-training task was exactly just phrase grounding, we didn't uh, fine tune any further. We just use our pre-trained model after 40 epochs that trained for about a week on uh, 32 GPUs uh, and just evaluated it on the Flickr data set. So there's, uh, it's the one below the, uh, sorry, the table is the one below, uh, not, the, yeah. This one? So, yeah. So there's two protocols. This is a bit weird. We had to report on two different protocols because we actually spent quite a bit of time trying to make sure we're evaluating it in the right way because there seems to be like two line of work, like the ones in the bottom half of the table don't cite the ones in the top and vice versa for some reason. So the ones in the top are like the image text, multimodal stuff. And the one on the bottom are more pure vision where they just like condition on the text and try to do detection, but they don't really do anything other than just like detecting the box, right? So merge box protocol just means that if there is um, one text which refers to multiple boxes, then you have to like merge all the ground truth. Now this is problematic if you think about it because if you pre-extract faster RCNN boxes and try to like uh, rank them using like, you know, whatever, how the other people do it, you're not going to have boxes that are merged because the object detector boxes are supposed to be like separate boxes for each you know thing in the image. So yeah, that's why like these uh, approaches like only site on themselves, I guess. On the other hand, uh, any box protocol does not mess with the ground truth. They say like, yeah, you have separate boxes. So if you just count it as a, a positive or like a correct uh, thing, if you have more than 0.5 IOU with any of the boxes. So that's why we call it any box protocol. So that, just to be clear about like what these two things are, but yeah, on both of these, basically we have like, yeah, we went from uh, 71.3 to 83 and uh, this was like with pre-training, but you can see the one without pre-training before that on Val, because we didn't like test it. Uh, it went from 70 to 78. So yeah, there was a huge uh, boost in performance on this task. And we were like super excited. And this is what gave us uh, the confidence to run the large pre-training run, run and like get results on that. And then the, the table above is the referring expressions of comprehension. Can you go up a bit, please? Yeah, one second. There we go. Yeah, so this one is a, a more, it seems like more papers report on this task. It's more popular than the Flickr. Uh, but the main idea here is that you have uh, uh, an image which has like multiple objects which are often of the same class, but there will be a text which distinguishes the two. 
So like there'll be a man in a red shirt, for example, where, where there'll be like two men in the image. So you need to like take the context and figure out which of the two you need to put a box around. Like so, the pink elephant. Yeah, the pink elephant. Um, yeah, so the Ref Coco, uh, Ref Coco Plus and Ref Coco G are three of these. Ref Coco G is, I think, the hardest uh, of these three because it has much longer sentences and like they're not allowed to use like uh, just like the Ref Coco is pretty silly sometimes actually because it'll be like left or man right or something like that. Like the sentence is extremely short and not very interesting. But Ref Coco G is like much more flowery la- language because these data sets were collected like one after the other with like refinement and how the process was used to like collect. Um, in terms of results, uh, we, we can see on Ref Coco G, we have like a good five points increase also on this, um, uh, on, this, uh, on this task. So that's really exciting. Villa, and, um, Villa is a paper which does like adversarial uh, learning on top of uh, really good uh, image text models that already exist. And it's, I think, from Europe's last year. So it was pretty recent when we submitted this. So we were really excited when we saw that, you know, our results are like substantially better than all of the baselines, even though they like train on like what, 4.6 million images and stuff like that. So yeah, this was, um, I think this is just like uh, a consequence of the fact that our pre-training is basically doing the right kind of uh, learning for this kind of task. Like, you know, all these other papers, they take faster RCNN boxes and then uh, kind of rank the boxes according to the text. They don't actually predict the box. So their, you know, performance is kind of upper bounded by the boxes that they have, which might not, you know, be good in the first place. So yeah, I, I think like the way we do it is like kind of pushing people to like change the way that they approach these tasks and that's uh, important. Yeah. No, I think that's a really, really good point. And having this end-to-end um, MD that makes things, I guess, makes things so easy uh, instead of having like that two-stage approach, because yeah. then you can have reason and you can match all of these different bounding boxes to one another. And um, that that's really exciting to hear. So I guess um, that's in terms of the downstream tasks. Mm-hmm. There's uh, also like a couple more, which maybe we can go over very quickly. Uh, which so is the segmentation? Way- yeah, there's GQA, which is question answering, which uh, I guess is like a really popular data set because it's a bit cooler than VQA in my, yeah, you can put this on. Um, I was going to put this on because I think this is important. Uh, yeah. I was going to ask question about the QA specific queries and how that's different. Thanks for yeah. bringing this up. Uh, uh, so for question answering, the main difference is apart from just detecting the boxes and knowing which box corresponds to which part of the text, you also have to give an answer. So uh, we had to fine tune on the GQA data set. Um, in, in addition to the existing architecture, which you know everything would have been the same as like for pre-training, except for these QA specific queries, like you just pointed out. So this is just like something we call it. It's just a few more object queries, uh, nothing special about them. All of these things at the bottom of the decoder are just like learnable embeddings. So they're just in, initialized from scratch. Uh, during pre-training, obviously, we don't have this uh, QA specific query. So yeah, during the fine tuning, we initialize from scratch. And the output of these is used to predict first the question type, where in GQA, we just like divide it by semantic types. And uh, and then according to like uh, which type it is, you'll have like a softmax over the answers for that type of question. So if it's like, you know, right. uh, query or uh, qu- like for clever, like it's like, count questions you'll have like numbers or whatever so yep. yeah it's a, no, that makes sense it's very it's very similar to the existing pre-training uh, model so that makes like the new components of the model that need to be trained are basically just these heads on top of the queries qa specific queries so yeah um i missed the details but in terms of like then qa specific do you remember off the top of your head like how many queries because i think dtr data had 100 object queries oh, as yeah, a yeah. standard so, so in uh, gqa i think there's five answer types so basically we'll have uh you know six of them yeah. because like one to predict the type and the five which are the actual going to predict the answer so that's it right so then i guess then when we're doing the fine tuning you just add those six to the mm-hmm. instead of like initializing the embedding as 100 you just initialize it as 106 exactly. which is the difference here okay that that makes um that's really good to hear yeah. so i guess then we just down to the conclusion um which is MDTR. I am so. Can we look uh, at the image once before we go to that? Like I. Oh, I'm so sorry. The segmentation. That, no, no. This um for the uh example of the question answering. Oh yes. This, uh, yeah. Okay. 
so yeah i guess uh, another cool thing that i want to point out about like mditer is basically you know you because you have uh, such dense uh, grounding you can really figure out what it's uh, looking at or what it's uh, reasoning using so what is on the table here it has a box around the laptop for the word what and you know a box around the table for table so it gives you a lot of like interpretability for question answering and it's really exciting that we can like actually tell you exactly what uh, it's looking at or like sure we used to have attention maps but they were never like very clean mm -hmm. right it's very different from having like explicit boxes which are uh, clean and like you know very uh, uh, tight around the object so yeah yeah and we'll go back to segmentation as well because now i realized that i skipped uh, segmentation i yeah. think there was an image somewhere about uh, is it in this version of the paper ashwarya i i think we don't have a yeah model thing but we can look at it in the collab once we're done with the paper oh i know the i know a really good place to find that um it's your github repository there's this uh, link to the website and i yeah. think there's a there was a I'll just go to the segmentation part because I think that's really cool to see as well. Like that's just another, oh, there it is. Like yeah. referring the street lamp, which MDTR yeah. can do. And it's segment pretty mode. cool because, you know, that street lamp is a uh, kind of odd looking and it's far away in the background, but we're still able to like give a very tight uh, mask around it. Even the next one, like major league logo, that seems like not a very, uh, you know, straightforward thing to like find and it does a very good job at it. So, yeah. I mean, of course we have, it's not uh, perfect, right? Like these are, uh, ch like cherry pick good examples that work well. It's not like we have hundred percent accuracy on this, but uh, it's exciting to see that it can do really well on a lot of uh, images. Well, the fact that you have examples to cherry pick, I think that's a that's an accomplishment in itself. So if you have examples of major league logo that can do this. I think that's a, that's quite a quite a good yeah. accomplishment. I mean, I just feel like so it's much. important to also like state your limitations, not be like you know. <laughs> This is the best uh, thing which can like solve every every uh, task. Yeah, I mean, there's still more work to be done, but yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Arun. So then, what's the uh, in terms of? I guess the, we'll we'll head to the AMA section now. Then, is there anything else you want to add about the paper, or you could for um, the AMA section, Ashwarya? Uh, yeah. No, I was just sending somebody the GitHub link, but yeah. Um, yeah. No, I just want to say that uh, overall, like this was a really fun project and. You know the i hope the code is like easy to use and we made sure to like release the uh code and release like collab so you can also like try and set up like add urls of any images from the web and like try to do face detection try to do segmentation try to do question answering and see what you get so it like will give you a really good sense of how the model is doing um if maybe if you have time in the after the ama we can like show them an example but yeah i, I just want to say that don't feel uh, scared to like uh, play with this. Uh, I think there's a lot more that can be done once, uh, yeah, that once you get used to like, you know, these kind of uh, models and it's an exciting area to work in. And, and the one thing I do want to, I think that's a great point to highlight. Another thing is that at Wits and Biases, then uh, there's something new that we're going to try as mm -hmm. well, that after the paper reading groups, we're going to start going into the code for those paper reading groups. So I guess it's really handy. Um, okay. It comes from the, uh, idea of like it's really handy to know what the paper is about but it's equally handy to then apply that paper so we're going to try actually we're going to try and go into the details of how mdtr is implemented um and we might fail at doing that but we at least we're going to try and get our hands dirty and look at all the loss functions and everything in pytorch code um so that's something that we we will do very soon um so that being said let me just quickly go to the forums uh for ama uh all right so we've got a few questions so we'll start with this one. Uh, question by Ramesh, if there's no fixed number of classes in the output, the predicted boxes is doing soft distribution over input tokens. Yeah, I, I answered this in the chat. He, he oh, edited. okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. I did actually answer it in the chat. <laughs> Sorry, I should read the whole thing first. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, can you go over the flattening uh, and concatenating of image features and text features? I okay. didn't quite understand what the final shape is expected to be. So, so if it was like batch size by sequence length by feature dimension, by the time, you know, you apply the linearity uh, or to like project to the size of the transformer. So the transformer size we use is 256. This is another thing that we never ablated, by the way, like we never tried bigger sizes. It's 
very possible that if you increase the size you'll get even better performance but um yeah we, there was limited time and like uh we didn't want to change too many things because detroit has a lot of knobs and you know we know a setting that works so we thought we'll just go with that but yeah so the cnn output uh is linearized so you'll have like you know batch size by a really long sequence of like the linearized image features uh by like whatever the feature dimension was at that layer and that's going to be down projected basically to 256 or like i don't know down or up projected basically changed to 256 and on the robot sorry, to cut. sorry to cut you just a quick right. one then so i'm just going to do this flattening so this then just becomes 256 right so then i've got 64 by 256 because then that becomes my number of channels or do you flatten this out as well the whole thing uh no it's like sequence length remains the same okay so sequence by the sequence so length stays all right. Okay. So keep, so I guess uh, keep the going. 16 by 16 is what becomes the sequence length and the 64 is your feature dimension. The 64 will become also 256 basically. In okay. So it's just the reshaping operation that yeah, happens yeah. after. Exactly. So you, you end up being like 256 by 64. Yeah. And then 64 reshape. will go through a linear and then you like to be the size of the transformer. And on the right. other side, yeah. And then the other side, the 10 by 768 will become 10 by 256, which is the size of the transformer. And then so you could reshape that again. Uh, yeah, so the 10 by 256 will be concat with the 256 by 256, basically. So you're, you'll get like 266 by 256. Yes, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, um, for this question, I guess it will be helpful when we go through the code. So that's something we do plan on doing next week anyway, but uh, that was really good. Uh, I think that, that, that should help it. So we have uh, 10 by 256 for these words, and then because uh, this 64 is going through the linear layer, which will then just change the dimension to be 256. Yeah. So you have 256 by 256 coming from here. And when you concatenate these two features, the, the top one being the image, the bottom one being the text, you get something like 266 by 256, which then goes into the transformer. Exactly. Cool. Um, Ramesh, I'm still not very clear on contrastive loss alignment. Is it like a triplet loss of minimizing the cosine distance between similar things? How do you yeah, handle so you negative You can think example? of it as like a margin loss where the thing that is being optimized, like the cosine cosine distance between the two, uh, you know, the, between the image and text embeddings. So if you open up the equation that we have in the paper, you'll get two terms. Um, maybe you can just look at it quickly. So yeah, so if you look at the uh, numerator, if you take uh, log of a by b, you're going to get log a minus, uh, like log of a minus log b. So basically, you'll the log and the x will cancel. So the you'll get one term which will have all of this summation stuff outside, and then something which is just minus of uh, oi transpose ti tj divided by temperature. So that oi transpose tj will need to become big so that this entire term is small because you want to minimize the loss, right? So minus of this term needs to be big so that you have the whole term go down. So that's why the embeddings of like OI and TJ need to be similar so that their dot product basically needs to be uh, big. And keep in mind that this OI and TJ, if you look at the code, you'll see that it's normalized before this dot product. So it's a cosine similarity and not a, just a dot product because if it was just a dot product, the norms of the vectors can basically just increase as much as possible to like, you know, make this big and you don't want that because you'll get instability in training so it's important to like normalize these two vectors take the dot product and that's the first part of the term the second term you'll notice is like a log sum x which uh which the denominator when it comes up you'll get like minus of log of one by something so that negative cancels so you'll get like you know log of sum of x so that term and the uh the uh, summation outside you'll notice it has a j which doesn't depend on the like the inner term of the denominator doesn't have any j's so basically your summation and the one by ti plus will cancel and you'll just have a positive log sum x of the denominator right so that term is basically the thing which is all the like positive and negative so in general yes you can also have just the negatives like you know the summation could have been just over the negatives but uh, experimentally, it's like we, we tried both and it seemed like if you have all the terms instead of just the negative terms, it's like more stable. So that's why we have it like this. 
I just have a quick question. When you mentioned J, what did you mean when you say oh, in the denominator? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just so, this, sorry. just this bit here. Yeah, yeah. So when you expand the the log of like the numerator by denominator, if you do log a by b, it's log a minus log b, right? So yeah. when when the second term will have all of the summation terms and will yeah. also have a uh, log of the denominator. But if yeah. you notice the denominator does not have any J terms, like it right. like, has no like J index. So basically right. it, you can take that out of the summation and the one by TI plus. Oh, of course. Plus. Okay. That makes sense. Got it. Thank you very much. So if uh, this, I explain it like this because that's explicitly how it's implemented in the code. So it might help to like hear this explanation when you read the code, it's like, you know, because we implemented it like line by line from the equation. So you, you'll be like, oh, why, why are you doing it like this? And maybe after like, if, if it doesn't make sense next week, when you're like reading the code, try opening up the equation like this. And that's exactly what is implemented. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, for context for everybody, I kind of emailed Ashwara before this event and I'm like, Ashwara, the equations one and two could be really daunting. So maybe it might help to go through the code, but that's something we will do next week anyway. Um, but after that explanation, I don't think those equations are daunting at all. Um, so thanks very much for that. Uh, so I guess Ramesh is asking, what downstream tasks can we use uh, MDT for? Can it be image only downstream tasks or does it need to be image text in GQA? Does the lab labels need to be as detailed as the initial pre-training? How much data is required for downstream tasks? Okay, so the first question, I'll just say that, I mean, it's supposed to be a multimodal model, so I'm not sure why you would want to use it for a, a image or text only. Um, for the GQA, uh, that's a good question. Yes, like GQA, when we were training, when we were fine-tuning, we first fine-tune where we actually use the alignment between the image, uh, sorry, the object and the text. So because GQA provides this, we were like, why not? We will continue having this phrase grounding, phrase grounding loss, like the normal loss from pre-training in addition to the fine tuning on the actual question answering. And um, how much data it depends, like for Flickr, we didn't fine tune so it because we basically just used all of the data for pre-training and just reported the results. Um, for RefCoco, it's a, um, I don't remember anymore. Sorry, it's been <laughs> my last few months have been working on a completely different project. So like the exact numbers of the data have like slipped from my mind. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would say it's not very big. So it, that's also a reason why we only fine tune the ResNet model and the B3, but not the B5 on the RefCoco because like the model is much bigger and we didn't want it to like overfit on the small data sets. So I would say if you don't have that much uh, fine tuning data for your downstream task, use the smaller model. Uh, and if you have lots of data, then just use the B5 because it's the best one. And yeah, so uh, we also have, if you look at the appendix, we have results on VQA. We didn't put it in the main paper because they're not like stunning results. <laughs> we just did it uh, to see what if we don't have like object to text span, um, you know, alignment, but we only have like higher level, like only at the entire so we pre-train on like phrase grounding and then fine tune only on question answering basically. So the supervision only comes from the answers. And um, we got like a decent score. It's not like state of the art, but it was like 70 something, which is like, you know, not, not a joke. So we were happy with that score. So yeah, that, that is the one downstream task that we tried where we don't have that much dense uh, annotation to answer your question. Well, thank you. Um... And then uh, I, there's this question about, okay, so are there any specific data augmentation on images and text that you ended up using yeah. for, so for, for fine tuning? Yeah, augmentation, um, the only thing you need to be careful about when you're using image text is like flips, because if you flip the you know uh, image, mm. you need to also flip the left, right, and things like that, which uh, was something that I didn't do in the beginning and it like kind of bit me <laughs> when I was doing my very early experiments is that something to be careful about. But other than that, on the image side, we used mostly the same transforms as Dieter. So like uh, random crops and, you know, things like that, jitters, whatever was in Dieter. So yeah, I, I didn't like change much in that. Thank you. Uh, and then the last question is, uh, is the Roberta frozen or is that also fine tuned? It's fine tuned. Yeah, we, we train everything. It, it has a different learning rate, so that was a bit hard because it was a, a lot of part, like already in data, you have like, you know, the encoder and the decoder and the backbone. And now we were adding one more part to the model, which also needed to, we had to figure out what learning rate to use it. So at some point we had like 
So the uh, the text encoder has a different learning rate schedule from the rest of the model. Actually, we use a like a linear warm up with DK as is common in NLP for the Roberta model. But for the detour part, we were using like a different step LR kind of like constant for pillar point and then drop for, for parts of the model. So yeah, there was a lot of uh, hyperparameter tuning that went into that. I'm, in my head, I'm uh, getting excited for getting my hands dirty with all this code. So everything you're saying, I'm like, oh yes, that's another thing I want to look at in code. <laughs> or, and when you say something else, I'm like, oh yes, that's another thing I want to look at in code. Um, so I guess that's where uh, we'll stop. Uh, Thanks so much, Ashwarya, for finding sure. the time and, and joining us today. I think it's been a really good experience learning about MDTA and learning about uh, everything that's that's the wonderful things that the paper can do and the wonderful experiments that you run and um, that you ran. And the it's really good to see all those stories that are behind the scenes of the paper. And it's really helpful, at least. So I guess um, thanks for finding the time and joining us on your evening. Of course. And we'll let you go now. And thanks, Ashura. So um, everybody, we will uh, thank you. And everybody for um, weights and biases context. And what we're going to start from here on is we're going to start also digging into a beginner friendly papers. So we're going to start with uh, rest nets or dense nets and similar papers. So the details will be out very soon. Um, but we're also going to look into the, the there's really a strong plan to start looking into the code for MDTA and run uh, every experiment or whatever we've learned today. We're going to run all those experiments and we're going to see how that thing looks like in code. And then we're going to try and match the equation to the code implementation. And we're going to try and match what uh, the good things that Ashwarya has explained to us today and then try and match that to the um, code implementations and see if we can find into our own data sets. Those are the plans. Next, um, Ashwarya, before you go, actually, I just had last question. I'm really sorry, but uh, you did mention you have, um, you, you're working on other projects. So what's next for M MDTA? So what's, uh, is that something you could share with us? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, like I haven't had much time to work on this during the summer because I've been at Google for the summer and I'm working on like vision language navigation, not really using MDTA, so like other other kind of uh, approach. But uh, now that the semester is starting again, I'll be going back to working on you know some follow-ups and it's mostly in like trying to make uh, MDTA be more um, versatile in terms of what tasks you can uh, approach, like more generation-based tasks, like captioning and things like that. And which will also help us like kind of use more data because uh, I, I still feel bad that, you know, Oscar and all of these uh, approaches use so much more data. So like we need to figure out how to like make MDT also scale up like that. And yeah, that's that's the next plan. Excellent. Thanks, Ashwarya. Thank you. Have a nice evening. And you.